when big guys score big goals, everybody's got 100 assists along with this guy. So scoring goals is what I did, and that's what I did. Well, Gordy was my idol. Gordy was somebody that I watched, you know, growing up. Uh, Bobby Hall was the other guy, Chicago and Detroit. Uh, back then, there wasn't the media like you have today, where you have, you know, you had one game Saturday night, hockey night in Canada, started at eight o'clock at night. I would start to watch the game if I wasn't playing, if I didn't have a, a game. And uh, I'd end up watching the first period and then I couldn't stand just watching. I'd go down, we had a basement where I lived and, and I would shoot pucks at, at uh, garbage cans and, and anything that I could hit 16, 17, 18, maybe three years later, uh, I get traded to the Detroit Red Wings. I meet the team in New York. Uh, we're playing in Madison Square Gardens. I walk into the dressing room. The lines are written up on the board and I'm playing center with Frank Mahovlich and Gordie Howe. Now I'm standing at center ice, we're starting the game. I look down and I see my name on my stick. It's not left five anymore, it's not left four. It's Unger on my stick. I looked up, the, the, there's 21,000 people in Madison Square Gardens. I said to myself, there's a net down there, bucks the same size. These guys all got skates on. I'm just gonna play hockey. Just, just like I'm playing outside. And from that time on, uh, the, the scare of being in that situation, the nervousness and all that stuff, I never had any of that stuff. And these guys mentored me all the way through, so it was, it was really kind of a really unique experience for me. Well, they hired a general manager named Ned Harkness uh, from Cornell University. Nobody knew who he was. He was a uh, a call for one of the first college coaches to come in and he was he was not happy with the way the Detroit Red Wing he was going to change everything we get to uh, must have been December and without without knowing it professional athletes don't want to lose games but without knowing it we didn't want to play for this guy there was three or four guys they stood up and they said, we're not playing for this guy tomorrow night. If they don't get rid of him, we're not playing the game. While we were in that room, they passed around a piece of paper saying that we wouldn't play for this guy. Flew back to Detroit early in the morning uh, the next day. On the little, you know, when you buy the papers, the Detroit Free Press, there was a headlines where Ned Harkness fired his coach but you can't read the bottom of the, the headlines. Opened up, got a paper. Ned Harkness fired his coach, now general manager, and he had this piece of paper. So if you look back to those years, that year, he just started trading guys, left and right. Guys were going all over the place. He called me in, the, tr the trainer called me in, and he said, Gary, the, I don't know what they call the guy at the time, but, but he wants to see you. So I said, okay. Everywhere I went for about a month before this, I was getting traded to Boston. I was going here, I was going there. So I went in and I sat down with him and he said, you know, he said, Alex Del Vecchio is gonna be retiring here pretty soon. And he said, as long as I'm here, you're gonna be my next captain. And I said, well, I really like that because I love Detroit. I love playing here. And two weeks later, he traded me to St. Louis. When I came to St. Louis, now I was in shape again. I don't know how many goals I had, maybe 10 or somewhere like that. And I, that was the only year that I didn't score 30 goals. I scored 28 uh, and scored a bunch of goals with St. Louis when I came to the team. They traded for me. Al went back as a player and Scotty came back on the bench. Scotty was a general manager. So I knew there was some things going on with the St. Louis organization because they were trying to change everything. 
I had I had played with Al. Al was in the Toronto organization uh, with the Rochester Americans in uh, in the American League, and Al was one of my first roommates. So I knew Al pretty well when I came to to St. Louis, and I think he may have had something to do with the fact of them trading for me. And uh, I finished the season with Scotty coaching, and then I think Scotty went to Montreal then, didn't he? Yeah, and Al took over. I think Al was was having trouble with Sid the Third, and Sid was a great guy. I love Sid. He was one of my favorite people. But I think Sid was getting into into Al's ear and not allowing him to do what he wanted to do with the team, and that's why Al left. But if Al had a stayed, it would have been a totally different organization back then because he went to the Islanders and look what he did in the Islanders. So, you know, there were some things that I didn't know about that was going on behind the scenes with Al. Uh, and that's when they started going through coaches. We had coaches left and right. I had a, I, I played with a guy named Mike Murphy. Mike's running the uh, war room in Toronto uh, for the NHL. He was one of my favorite wingers. He was my right winger. Another guy was Jack Eagers, was my left winger. Uh, they both came from the Rangers. But every time I got a, a guy that I really clicked with as far as a, a, a winger, like Brett Hall and, and, and Oates, uh, Gretzky and, and Yerry Curry, uh, they always had two guys that played well together. What they would do with me was we were trying to get three balanced lines. We were the top line, so they'd put me down with a couple of lesser s wingers and put in another centerman there to make us have a little more balance on the team. So I was always playing with different, different forwards all the time, and then not that they were bad players, but I just, you get used to guys and it really makes it a lot easier. So I, I that's why I have more goals than I do assists because of the scrambling around of the line situations. A lot of times when, when big guys score big goals, everybody's got 100 assists along with this guy. So it, it was a tough time, but I, I tried not to let that bother me and I just, scoring goals is what I did and that's what I did. So 72, 73, 119 penalty minutes, which is more than, more than Bobby had, more than Barkley had. Too. Well, I, you know that that's really funny because Bobby and I were talking one time, it, w it was after Bar Bark had left. <clears throat> and I said, so you're, you're really a tough guy. Because I fought those guys when I was with Detroit. I fought Bobby and I fought Noel Picard. One of the things that I, playing in Western Canada, you had to, you had to fight. If you were a goal scorer, somebody was coming after you. And I didn't need anybody to protect me. I learned how to fight when I was a kid. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't looking for trouble, but if somebody wanted to go, and when I came up into the NHL, I was sitting with Gordy and Alex and these guys, and they said, listen, here's what you need to do. He said, we've, we've seen you fight. I'd already had a couple fights with Detroit. He said, we've seen you fight. He says, here's what you need to do. You fight one guy on every team. They'll give you the respect. You'll get some room and you'll score some goals. So that's what I, that's, kind of what, and I didn't do it on purpose, but when the chance came, I, I used to fight. So so we're sitting around with Bobby and I said, so you're you're a tough guy. I said, I got more penalty minutes than you, than you do. He said, wow, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I that, I played every, every type of game that they wanted to play. When you get traded for a guy, there's a little bit of a rivalry. I go to Detroit, I make sure Red Barron's is not gonna score. You know, he's doing the same thing to me. I was out at the farm, Mr. Solomon was out that night. He, we used to go out for dinner with him every once in a while, he'd come out and he said, I gotta ask you something, Gary. He said, I got a chance to get Red back, back to St. Louis. He said, I, I know you were traded for him and all that stuff. I said, listen, get him back. I said, he was a leader here, he's a great guy. Uh, the guys love him. I said, I think that would be great for our team. So that's when they brought Red back and I got to play with him and, and know him a little bit. Uh, we had a fairly tough team. We didn't get a lot of publicity. 
Uh, there wasn't the media coverage that there is nowadays where all teams are kind of equal. The, the media coverage was coming from, from Philadelphia and from New York and from, from the East, East Coast. I mean, we went into Philadelphia and nobody, I mean, if there was fights, we were right on the top of it. I saw Gasser, Gasser spot, Hound Dog Kelly, uh, Battleship Kelly, uh, uh, Schultz in, in one game. So uh, all of a sudden we had a pretty tough team and had some room to, to kind of move around a little bit. But Bobby and, and Pick and, uh, and especially Gasser, uh, they, gave us, they gave us that toughness. I was a little bit of a rebel at times. Uh, you know, I hated wearing a shirt and tie. I hated dressing up every game. I, I liked to be neat. And, but when I, when I went to New York, uh, we'd get off the plane and we'd go back to the hotel and I'd put my jeans and cowboy boots on and I'd walk around town. And if I ever ran into one of the coaches, I was getting fined because I, I wasn't dressed the way I was supposed to be dressed as an NHL guy. I was driving a motorcycle. I was riding horses. Uh, you know, I'm doing all this stuff. And Emil and I kind of kind of butted heads a little bit. And as it, as it went on, I started getting less ice time, uh, switching the lines, all, all that type of thing. And it just, it wore down on me uh, as, as a veteran guy. You know, I was my own guy. They, they, you know, I wore some crazy suits at the, back in the day, and 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 guys used to talk talk to me about some of the stuff that I wore, and I said, listen, I don't follow the styles, I make them. So, you know, just, just but I was a team guy right to the end. And then, and, and if, if you want to skip over this, we will. But the one of the darkest days in Blues history, that Memorial Day weekend in '77. Well, that changed my life, totally. I mentioned to you that I had a 200 acre farm out at the out at Villa Ridge. Uh, I had a dirt track set up for my motorcycles. The guys, it was open to all the guys to come out. I had guys that were hunting out there and uh, Larry Patey would come out hunting and Bruce Affleck and uh, Gasser and myself, uh, John Davidson uh, were a little more of the cowboy kind of guys. We would, we would ride and we did lots of stuff out at the farm. At the end of that season, uh, my wife was really close to Diane. Gasser and, and I were pretty tight. And he would come out and ride the horses and do, he was a cowboy. And it was a May 24th weekend. Season was over, hockey was done. We decided to have a, uh, a pig roast on May 24th weekend. So I invited all, all the guys that were still in town, all the blues guys that were still in town uh, all my friends, there was quite a few people out there and we had a pig roast. And it was in the afternoon, it was getting close to the time we were, we were gonna eat. And these, we, I had one of, the, it was called an Odyssey. It was a 250 Honda and it was a little wee, kind of like a four wheeler thing, but it, it flew. And we were, I was out doing something and I looked over and I see this Odyssey flying in the air and gassers on it. And he went around another time and then he came back and we were sitting there and, and I saw a gasser trying to start one of the motorcycles. And this was like after the day. We're out of mix, we're out of Coke and pop and stuff like that. We need to get that. And we're almost ready to eat. So I turned from, from Bobby on the bike and I, went to get somebody to go get this, this drink, the drinks. Bruce Affleck was on my, one of my road bikes. My two, uh, there was two little kids there. There were 10 or 11, somewhere like that. They were on, a, on a, uh, their little dirt bikes. It was my agent's guy, Morty Ebeling was his name. And, and Gasser. I had a, easement across my property of, of which was a gravel road that went through another guy's field before I came to the blacktop out where the cars are. 
So while I'm doing this thing, getting it organized with the with to, to get some more mix for the for the party, these guys got on the bike, Gasser got on the bike, and they rode out, and they stopped at the end of the gravel road. Uh, this is, I'm hearing this from Bruce and the two little boys that were there. They got to the end of the road, and the little boys stopped, and the kids said, "We're not allowed to drive on the blacktop." You know, we were driving around the farm. We're, we're, Bobby said, nah, we'll just go up, up the road and come back. So apparently, according to Bruce, they went up over across Highway 100, which goes into Washington. The little town that I lived in was called Villa Ridge, and it was up where the, where the drinks were. They had gone up there. Um, there were no more than three miles from the farm turned around and were coming back. There was a hill, one of those hills where you're driving in Missouri and you come to the top of the hill and all of a sudden there's a car there and you're, something happened. So now I'm at the farm and I get a call. And I'm looking around and I'm saying, everybody that I know other than my parents in Alberta are here. I know this is a serious call. Guy gets on the phone, says this is Missouri State, State Troopers. He said, do you know Bobby Gasol? And I knew something had happened in my spirit. I could feel it. And I, all I could say was, is he okay? Is he all right? Is he okay? And Bobby Plager came over. Diane was was pregnant. It was she was, I think, seven or eight months pregnant with Bobby Jr. And I was in shock because I knew something had happened. Bobby got on the phone. He said, "We're we're going up there." I said, "I I can't go." Bobby was the toughest guy I ever played with. We, we were indestructible. He's jumping 50 feet on this odyssey. I'm jumping motorcycles, breaking horses. Nothing can bother us. And all of a sudden, this guy's gone. <sighs> I, I didn't know where it went. I didn't know where I was. It was a start of me saying, I need to find out. I need to find out. Life isn't just about playing hockey. And that was the start of my spiritual journey I was fortunate enough to play in the National Hockey League. I was doing what I loved to do. Uh, I was never unhappy. I was never depressed. I never had anything, you know, my parents were all still alive. I'd never been through a death before. And all of a sudden I started questioning things. And I, I had a void in my life somewhere that I thought might have been a Stanley Cup. You know, I was I was getting on in age. I was over 30, and I wasn't getting along with Emil Francis. And I thought, well, it might be time to to uh, try and go to a, a, comp a competing team. Al Arbor was in Islanders, and they were talking to me. I was searching. I had a great family, and I had my farm, and all this stuff that I dreamed of when I was a kid and I still had something missing and, and something big was missing after Bobby after the, that incident and that's how I ended up going to Atlanta but I was again it wasn't a hockey deal 
It was, it was a spiritual thing that I was dealing with. And when I went to Atlanta, there was a couple of Christian guys on the team. Uh, I started watching them, started doing some other stuff with, with the normal guys. Uh, and at the end of the season, they invited me to go to a Christian athletes convention. I went there with my wife and that's when I made a commitment. I, I found out that that void that I had in my life was a, was a relationship with God, not anything to do with sports or a Stanley Cup or anything like that. And that's what changed my life spiritually. There's another spiritual side to this story as well. I have a sister that's five years younger than me that had polio and, she, and she's in a wheelchair. Her, her legs never, her, her muscles never grew in her legs. She walked in braces and crutches. She was in a wheelchair. I was playing football and soccer and hockey and out and, and she could never ever get out of this chair. And it gave me a mentality of when I got hurt, if I got a, there's a difference between being hurt and being injured. Every guy that's playing this game is hurt, every game. They're going on the plane with ice packs on their shoulders and ankles and knees and whatever. Whenever I got to that point and I started feeling sorry for myself about anything, not even a, just about hockey, I thought of my sister and I thought, what would I be like? She was happy, she was a, uh, she was a swimmer, she, she was a great kid, but could never walk. And I thought, what would I be like if I could never walk, if I could never play this game, I could never come to St. Louis and enjoy this life that I'm living only because I've got legs. And so, when I got a little bit of an injury, it never bothered me. Our family was, my dad was, was a tough guy. Uh, I boxed when I was a kid. I wrestled when I was a kid. I did all those things and it built up a mentality for me, probably from my genes, that I had a fairly high pain tolerance. I'd broken my nose 11 times, broken my cheekbone twice. Uh, I've got probably over a hundred stitches on my face. We never wore helmets. Uh, you know, I've separated my shoulder. Tommy Woodcock would tape it up and away we'd go. Uh, you know, something else would happen. I'd tape my knee and away I'd go. Uh, and my sister gave me a lot, of, a lot of inspiration to be able to fight through things like that. I never did it to get the Ironman streak. That's not why I did it. I didn't like to miss any games. I never missed any day of school. If I had a runny nose, I didn't say, Mom, I'm going to stay in bed for an hour here and, and not go to school. I wanted to do my normal, my normal day work or school or whatever I did. And it just got to be a habit. St. Louis has always been very special to me as far as the fans and the fans in St. Louis, the people in St. Louis, the people that we met, the way the family was with the Solomon family that were tight family orientated team. We did lots of stuff together. Uh, it was just a really special place to play. Totally different from a lot of the other places I've been. <laughs> 